Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. as the new revolution in travel accommodation. It's captured everyone's imagination. Airbnb. Airbnb is the perfect combination of hotels and hostels. So you end up having fun, you go to bars, you, you really have a little adventure. It's cheap, that's obviously the main thing. The choice is endless. You can have a dream stay in a castle or a tree house. Or like Beyonce and Mariah, spend thousands on luxury accommodation. The best Airbnb I've seen is like one that's like a shell house. I think it's in Portugal. But if things go wrong... Oh, my goodness. It's a total living nightmare. It's amazing that they could do so much damage in one night. Who's there to pick up the pieces? Just felt like they were completely unaccountable. As home sharing becomes big business, the company faces a backlash. We need housing supply in central London. Airbnb is undermining that, and they're not playing fair. They're not playing by the rules while they do it. Airbnb started out eight years ago, offering blow-up mattresses in the spare room of co-founders Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia. The two friends had spotted an unlikely business opportunity. I uh, was living with my roommate Joe in San Francisco and I couldn't afford to make rent. That weekend International Design Conference was coming to San Francisco. All the hotels were sold out. Joe had three airbeds. We pulled the airbeds out of the closet. We inflated it. We called it the airbed and breakfast. The design school graduates made it possible for us to book rooms in other people's houses across the world with a few simple clicks of a mouse. You just go on the website, you search where you want to go, you type in the place, uh, type in your budget. You know, it can be done in a matter of minutes. It wasn't plain sailing at first for the two young entrepreneurs, who started out with just a couple of listings on a small website. Brummy Balaram is an expert on the so-called sharing economy. It took a while for, uh, for Airbnb to actually kick off, but then when it did, people really started to warm to the idea, not necessarily for economic reasons, but more because of social reasons. It was all about making social connections and getting to meet new people, and this whole idea of uh, trust. But once the growth started, it didn't stop. By taking between 9 and 12% of each booking, the company, which describes itself as a trusted community marketplace, is now valued at over $25 billion. Tens of thousands of people in the UK let out rooms or entire homes on Airbnb. For many, it provides valuable extra income. As far as I can tell, if people are working and they're making income, they depend on that income, and half of our hosts depend on it to pay the rent or mortgage, this is a job. Mom of two, Leah, rents out two rooms in her family home in Peckham, South London. Well, we started doing Airbnb because I got made redundant after maternity leave, and I've just been able to spend more time at home with the kids, and I've just really appreciated every moment. She charges from £40 a night for a double or twin room. We've met some great people, um, even a couple that stayed with us. That they, they got engaged on their trip to London when they were staying with us, and they now send us postcards every now and then. For the host signing up, it couldn't be easier. Literally, all you need to do is um, give, your, give your listing a name, um, and then Airbnb send out a photographer. We're offering a, an affordable place to stay um, for guests that want to interact, they want to talk to us. I know myself, when I visit a city, I want to see what the local people are doing, where they go to have their coffee. Um, and that's what, that's what a lot of the guests like to do when they stay with us. So it's, it's an alternative to staying in, a, staying in a hotel. Around the world, hosts like Leah are benefiting from the new Airbnb phenomenon. But it doesn't always go smoothly. A number of shocking stories have emerged. From prostitution to drug dens. 
one couple in Canada came home to these scenes. Oh, my goodness. Their once beautiful family home had been totally trashed by a guest who said he was in town for a wedding, but had thrown a huge party. Have you ever seen anything like this? This is disgusting. The owners, Star and Mark King, didn't know anything was wrong until they received a text from their neighbors. Instantly, I called my neighbor friends and I'm like, what is happening? And they're just like, there's people smashing bottles outside. They saw Maseratis, Lamborghinis, party bus pull up with 100 people get out. So we contacted the police and uh, said, could you please come with us to our home? Because of the rules with short-term lease agreements, the police were unable to evict the partygoers, so Starr had to plead with them to leave. It was an hour and a half before the last of the revelers left. We walked in with the police, and uh, I, I just, like, like, we were just both, like, lost in this, like, holy cow, what happened to our home. Oh, he said he was here for a wedding. It was horrible, it was nightmarish. We saw used condom wrappers, used condoms, um, just left in like food containers, just strewn around, blood, semen, vomit, it, like nothing, nothing looked the same. We had a beautiful cowhide skin rug. It was completely balled up with all sorts of condiments and human fluids and there's no doubt about it that there was like sex happening all over our home, drugs happening all over our home. It's just unbelievable to see your home used like a, some disgusting brothel or whatever it may, it may have been is just, it's a nightmare. It's a total living nightmare. Before long, the story was out. We just put it on our own personal social media accounts to show our families and friends and instantly it kind of went viral and people started hashtagging Airbnb and going, Airbnb, you better fix this for my friends. As soon as they realized the magnitude of it, they were on it. I think if, if they didn't come through with their guarantee, it would, it would have looked very bad. Airbnb paid for everything, including rehousing the family temporarily, as the house was uninhabitable. Even though Airbnb made a, like, they took care of the home and it looked beautiful again, it just, it would be hard to make that place a home. So we basically just decided to pack up and move, move far away. <laughs> The whole incident is thought to have cost Airbnb more than £50,000. Police in Canada are still trying to track down the culprit. What Star and her family experienced was extreme, but significant damage like this is rare. Airbnb couldn't have done more to help, but not everyone has found the company so accommodating when things have gone wrong. They talk the good talk. They have very nice photographs on their website, but when it comes down to it, the customer service is pretty poor. Please help Airbnb. How do we speak to someone? Nightmare guests wrecking house. In London, at the end of last year, 32-year-old Nigel Broom took a last-minute booking for New Year's Eve at his father's £600,000 apartment in Forest Hill, South London. It was brand new. It had only been slept in maybe six or seven nights before. It's quite high spec, so it has a solid ash floor, sedum roof, underfloor heating, ash ply finishing everywhere, all sorts of luxury bits and pieces. We let it to this guy who was very young, I don't remember exactly how old, maybe 21, 22. Um, it said that he'd been to Durham University, it said that he was in recruitment. He'd only just joined up on Airbnb, so there was no, no reviews for him, no feedback on him. It didn't go according to plan. A group of 100 young people arrived at the flat to throw one almighty New Year's Eve party. <laughs> we had uh, an email from a neighbour saying that there was a lot of noise, a lot of teenagers around, uh, people peering in their windows, rubbish bags everywhere, drug paraphernalia, uh, all of that sort of thing. It made me feel very, very worried and 
uh, powerless because I was on the other side of the world without a proper internet connection. The next day, the neighbour went to the flat, took photographs of the aftermath and sent them to Nigel, who was several thousand miles away. The picture showing black everywhere over the floor, you know, as you would get with a big party with 100 perhaps people. The first person to get in touch with Airbnb was my dad. He spoke to someone who seemed quite junior. They made all sorts of soothing noises, but didn't do very much except send the standards email. Nigel estimated the damage totaled almost £12,000, the main expense being the whole of his father's solid ash floor which needed replacing. So he looked to Airbnb for help. My experience of customer service was pretty terrible. Everybody I got to speak to was somebody new. They were just very polite and really nothing else. It was just a complete and total waste of time with nothing happening for at least a week. When something actually happens, then you start reading the terms, you see all the disclaimers, and you start to think, are we really covered? Are they really going to pay out? Airbnb make it clear in their £600,000 host guarantee that there are limits and exceptions. In actual fact, when you read their policy, it has written all over it, this is not insurance. You need to take insurance as well. Why it says that if they're guaranteeing any losses, I have no idea. Ultimately, I understand it to mean that it's totally at their discretion whether they pay you or not. For Nigel, 10 days had passed with no promise from Airbnb of paying up, so he contacted the press. It was very noticeable that as soon as reporters were involved in it, then I was getting calls from someone more serious. It was very strange at the end, the way that they, they dealt with me. They sent an email saying, this is our offer. It's uh, two or three thousand pounds less than, than what you said the cost is. You've got 72 hours to accept it on our form, our standardized form, or we'll withdraw the offer and, and cancel the whole claim. You're then not able to speak to them in any way about that. And that was really quite shocking. Airbnb told us they had zero tolerance for this behaviour, that the guest is no longer on Airbnb, and that some host guarantee claims are complex, which can take time. Coming up, the problems guests face when their Airbnb doesn't meet expectations. When I was taking a shower, those wires caught fire. And the first thing when you opened the door, we didn't know what the smell was, but it was gross. In early 2009, Airbnb had just a few thousand listings. Today, it has more than two million worldwide. Airbnb has become one of the, the biggest companies um, in the sharing economy, and it's starting to give traditional industry a run for its money. It's definitely the most recognizable name. New statistics obtained by Channel 4 show the UK now has more than 80,000 listings. Over a third of these are in London, though Airbnb is growing fast in other major cities and coastal areas. With more and more people listing their homes every week, the risk of incidents is bound to increase, as Dominic Jones and his flatmate found out when they let out their apartment in Islington. Just saw that the place had been trashed, so there were kind of cigarette butts stubbed out in the carpet. There was food and mess and kind of laughing gas balloons everywhere, and they just left it in a complete tip. I mean, there were even, you know, condoms and things lying around in the bedroom and the bathroom. The damage was bad enough, but Dominic soon realised one of his prized possessions, a print by the artist Banksy, had gone missing. It was a Banksy and I bought it when I was, it was for my 21st birthday, so I'd only paid just under 100 quid for it. And I knew it maybe gained value a little bit, but I didn't quite realise until it got stolen how much. The stolen print was now worth £8,000, but Dominic hoped it would be easy to trace with Airbnb's help. I thought this could be a really stupid kind of crime to commit because essentially, you know, Airbnb have all the guys' details, they know who's in the flat, um, you know, if a picture goes missing, you just think, well, it's simple, just the police would go around there and, um, and, and get the picture back. But the problem, he says, was Airbnb did not cooperate. We'd been trying to get Airbnb um, to contact the police 
and the police have been trying to contact Airbnb. They didn't, we didn't hear anything back, just got directed to kind of online web forms. There was, there was just nothing. It just felt like they were completely unaccountable. It was only after the flatmates contacted the media that Airbnb kicked into action. But Dominic claims by then it was too late. Nothing happened for about six weeks. Airbnb didn't pass the details on to the police. And it was only really when we went to the press that then it, then it kind of mattered to them. Airbnb paid for the party damage swiftly after Dom's story broke, but not the Banksy. The one shot we really had to, to get the picture back was if, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours after it had happened, Airbnb had worked with the police basically to pass on the guy's details and then the police could have followed up with it quickly. Um, I think we'd have stood quite a good shot of, of getting the picture back for an organisation that is built on trust, that they just don't seem to take any responsibility when something goes wrong to, to fix it. Um, you know, even something basic like cooperating with the police. Since this interview, Airbnb have compensated Dom for the Banksy and told us they've removed the guests from the service and are assisting the police. There's no doubt that hosting on Airbnb requires a leap of faith. Guests are also taking a risk. They have to trust that their accommodation will live up to the promises online. Hi, my name is Nick Gudgeon. This is the apartment um, that we got stuck with. As you can see, extremely, extremely small. This is a closet that they shoved the bed in. And yeah, I mean, you can barely walk inside here. And then uh, here's the other tiny room, extremely small. Um, going into the bathroom, if you want to call it a bathroom, look at this. I can't even fit in the door. Check this out. This wasn't the worst of it. Nick was lucky not to get electrocuted in the Airbnb flat. The big issue is that when I was taking a shower, me, earlier today, those wires caught fire in the middle of my shower. After tweeting on social media about the experience, Airbnb swooped in and transported Nick and his friends to luxurious accommodation. Others whose experiences have been more disappointing than dangerous have found Airbnb less helpful. So they've turned to websites where they can vent their spleen. Trustpilot has more than a thousand reviews of Airbnb. Most of them are negative. Airbnb Hell, meanwhile, carries 400 stories detailing disappointments, mainly from guests. Our original plan was to use Airbnb as an apartment. Um, the fact was it was more of a grubby bed set, uh, such was, you know, the beds were just so bad. And I told them exactly what I thought of them. Got no response from either of them. Nobody seems to care. They just don't, they just don't care. We stayed in an Airbnb in Greece. We should have known something was off and we had to meet him in the middle of an abandoned field somewhere. We got back there, it was absolutely disgusting. It was so grimy and we didn't even last an hour. It was human hair on a bare mattress. I thought, absolutely no way, I'm not staying here. But if you don't stay at an apartment, you can't review it. So I can't warn other people. Airbnb say that on the rare occasion that a guest has a bad experience, they work fast to make things right. Some of the negative postings question the reliability of Airbnb's own review system, that very review system that was designed to build trust. Andy and Jan posted on Airbnb Hell after an experience in Dublin that almost ruined their 60th birthday celebrations. So there we go, we arrive, don't we, after a lot of hassle, and the first thing when you open the door, the smell hit us. And we didn't know what the smell was, but it was gross. We soon found out when we went in the kitchen and opened the fridge door. The electrics had gone and the fridge was full of rotting food. When we went into the living room, there were two young men there who were also staying in this flat, sleeping on the couch. In fact, I think they were as surprised to see us as we were to see them. Faced with little alternative, the couple held their nerve and their noses and stayed that first night. The next day, they checked into a hotel. 
You yeah. said you, you think you might have cried. You did cry. Did I? <laughs> yes, yeah. Because yeah. it, like it was it was very upsetting. It was upsetting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it was upsetting. I just thought, good grief! What you know? What have we walked into? What really upset Andy was when he tried to leave a review on Airbnb's website. He says it was blocked. They wouldn't allow me to post it. Mm. Words to the effect of your review has been rejected. They don't say why. I think that's a big thing, actually, because yeah. you just can't trust the website because you don't know if you are getting a balance of reviews. We will never, but... ever Airbnb again. No. Airbnb say all their reviews are authentic and that this one was published and public. They add that the listing was later removed by the host. A common concern of people who are new to Airbnb is the personal security risk of staying as a guest. Like other Airbnb guests, Susie Anasi relied on trust when she went to stay with a host at his apartment in Paris. My first point was try to find a place with uh, maybe a woman, just because that was my first time traveling alone. But there was no availability at the point, so the only flat that they found it was this guy. I read the review because the first things you do on Airbnb, spoke a bit with him, it seems everything was fine. He said, yeah, the room is free, so, so I booked the room with him. When Susie arrived, her young Parisian host was there to greet her, but he told her the room she'd booked wasn't available. We came in and it was like, there is a guy here in the room, so you need, uh, you can use my room, it's fine. It's like, what? What your room? I rent your room. Why are you giving me away now your room? And why are you going to sleep? It's like, oh, on the sofa is fine. Susie's host was watching a film and asked if she wanted to join him. We were sitting on the sofa next to each other and he was com coming a bit too close, you know. It's not like having a conversation, watch a movie, but you're not my friend. Don't come too close with me. Don't invade my space. Yeah, I, you just met me. You can't be like that. You need to keep a bit of distance. So they just say, OK, thank you for the night, try to be nice, you know, enjoy the movie, but tomorrow, um, yeah, I need to wake up early, so just went to bed. Susie went to sleep, but that wasn't the end of her creepy experience. I remember Sunday morning was the worst moment ever. I wake up and, you know, you just, you're very sleepy because you have another good night and you wake up. You open your eyes and you can feel that there's something wrong in the room. But what's, what's wrong? Open my eyes, I look, and he was sitting at the end of the bed, staring at me. And I was like, whoa, mate, what are you doing here? Why are you staring at me like this? It's really creepy. And he's like, oh, morning. Finally, we woke up and like, finally, I wake up. How long have you been here? <laughs> I actually locked myself in the bathroom until he was, I heard him say, OK, I'm going to see you later. I can't wait to see you later, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah. Susie contacted Airbnb almost immediately. And they said, well, in this case, you know, it's your word. I still remember that word. It's your word against his. So it's nothing we can do. So this could happen to everyone else now because you're not taking any action. Susie tried to put it all behind her, but almost two years later, she spoke to a magazine and her story was published. In response, Airbnb got in touch, asking if she wanted to report the host to the police. How I can trust a brand that they just ignored my story for two years until the story went public? Airbnb told us they accept that their initial response was unacceptable. They say they apologised to Susie, issued her a refund and removed the host. Coming up, Anger as owners find their flats illegally sublet on Airbnb. From the reviews that we saw, we could see that hen parties had been here with groups of 12 people. And claims Airbnb's damaging city communities. I think Airbnb is changing the landscape of cities. It's turning residential neighbourhoods into tourist neighbourhoods. Airbnb sells itself on the idea of sharing capitalising on the publicity value of the cool, caring ethos. More than 80 million guests have used the online accommodation platform. The, the local knowledge has been absolutely brilliant and we've had some great fun. 
absolutely great fun and we've tended to share in a bit of their lifestyle as well. Airbnb has been a great experience. My hostess, the homie, has showed me so much of the city already. But where I've really used it and had fun is have roommates because you share the space with their roommates. So you end up having fun, you go to bars, you, you really have a little adventure. But some experts are starting to question where Airbnb's initial aims are now heading. Bromi Balaram has written a report on the sharing economy. They started off as alternative, socially minded enterprises, but over time as more people um, have started to use the platform and the platforms have become more popular, they've become a bit more commercial and it seems like it's more about profit, it's more about the economic drive rather than the social or the environmental uh, initial aims of the platforms. Housing activist Murray Cox scrapes the Airbnb website for data to map and track the company's listings, which he then publishes on his website, Inside Airbnb. So London has the highest growth rate out of the top three cities in the world. It's a 94%, so almost a doubling every year. He's found that in big cities like London, Airbnb listings are becoming dominated by entire homes rather than rooms in people's houses. My data, first of all, shows that the majority of listings are entire homes. Um, in some of the inner city uh, boroughs, uh, like Camden, um, Kensington and, and Chelsea and Westminster, those numbers are almost like two thirds of the listings are entire homes. And so I think that completely dispels the myth that Airbnb and platforms like it are um, people sharing out their homes. Scores of property management companies have sprung up to support hosts who have properties they want to let out as entire homes. Husband and wife Kremi and Alex run one of these businesses. There's the full service, what we do, uh, we also take care of the meet and greet of the guests, we do the cleaning, um, we do property management, you know, when it's needed, if something goes wrong with the boiler or burst pipe. The company also markets properties for hosts, listing them on Airbnb and 50 other sites helping them maximise their return. If you get it right, uh, it can be very, very lucrative. We've got some property owners that they might have a, a relatively modest two-bedroom flat, but it's in the right area and they could be earning net, i.e. after our fees, five, six, seven thousand pounds a month. The properties they list range from a one-bed apartment in Greenwich for £75 a night to a three-bed in the West End for £700 a night. It's, it's very much location dependent in terms of how if you want to make money from it, location is really key. We do have some, some foreign investors, but the majority, I would say, of our clients are, are people who typically, they're retired, they live in the country, they've got a second home or apartment in London, they use it occasionally, and they want us to, to let it out uh, when they're not, not using it. Not only are there a lot of entire homes listed on Airbnb, data from the website Inside Airbnb shows that increasingly hosts in London have more than one property listed. So on my website I can look at how many listings each host has um, and I can see where the listings are. Um, there's someone in here that has 229 listings. These people don't live in those homes, they're renting it out for profit. Um, the fact that they've got um, hundreds of listings, there's a financial incentive to be doing this um, commercially. The reality is, in some of the inner city boroughs, up to half of the listings are these commercial operators that have multiple homes. Airbnb say sites like Murray's use inaccurate information to make misleading assumptions and stress some hosts list multiple rooms in their homes or manage listings for others. For Murray Cox, the picture is clear. He's concerned that the proliferation of tourist flats is damaging communities in central London. I think Airbnb is changing the landscape of cities. It's turning residential neighbourhoods into tourist neighbourhoods. Um, and that, that's bad for people that want to live in the city. One of the most affected areas is around Soho. Residents in this apartment block say it's starting to feel like an unstaffed hotel. Lara has lived here for 19 years. Um, one of the main problems is security. Obviously, we don't know who the people are and why they're staying in the apartments. Sometimes people don't have a front key, for example, and so they end up passing on any 
other apartments saying, can you please let me in? But it's very difficult to know whether these people are, have any right to be in the building or not. In many apartment blocks, it's against the terms of the lease to sublet very short term without the permission of the freeholder. Laura's visiting other residents to talk about where they stand. This one is definitely looks like the flat upstairs. That is going for £90 per night. They say it's maximum for four. Gosh. Four? <laughs> four, pe four, four in people. a studio apartment. When you have all the noise and you have all of the, the disruption and it's just the, the, the lack of consideration. There is nobody supervising or even looking no. after the tenants. No. If there is any problem, I suppose there is somebody on the other side of the telephone, but there isn't some, somebody here dealing with any problem. The residents believe there are three, maybe four, short-term rentals in their small block. They were playing music to two or three in the morning. Couldn't sleep, and I was so tempted so many times just to go up and tell them to shut up, really. If you're letting a, um, a flat out via, via Airbnb, you really do need to consider the other tenants Absolutely, in the block. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much that happens. I think that they need to have some kind of they need control like, like that, because yeah. otherwise it's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's just come and go as you please. In Soho and Covent Garden, there's a massive economy from Airbnb. And communities sort of, you know, sort of falling into the sea and gone, really. It's like, it's like they're hollowing out the heart of, of the centre yeah. of London yeah. and they're replacing it with holiday yeah. life. There's only so, so much that we could actually do about this. I it's, think there needs to be legislation agree, to control absolutely. it. Even landlords who let out their properties long term through reputable estate agents are finding they're being hijacked by commercial operators who take advantage of Airbnb to sublet. Property lawyer Paula Felton is contacted around 10 times a week by people who suddenly discover their flat is being illegally listed. So this is my client's property. This apartment in Soho was let out to a seemingly respectable tenant on a long lease. But unbeknown to the owner, the tenant used the flat to rake in cash. So this is the flat which was uh, illegally sublet. It's a lovely um, three-bedroom flat, which is unusual for the area. It made it a prime target for what actually happened. Paula's client was first alerted to the problem by others living in the block. The neighbours started to complain to my client about the noise that was coming from the flat. Um, there were parties being held here. The door had been taken off one of the rooms in the flat that was left downstairs at the entrance hall. When the apartment's owner investigated online, she discovered the property was being illegally sublet on Airbnb and was almost unrecognisable. So this is the master bedroom. It was um, decked out in a very uniform um, almost hotelish sort of way when we discovered the property on the website. One of the real concerns was that they'd moved my client's own um, furniture out. They were asking for groups up to 14 people charging uh, £250 a night. From the reviews that we saw, we could see that hen parties had been here with groups of 12 people. So you're breaching a lot of the rules and regulations in relation to housing laws. After months of fighting, Paula managed to get the tenant to leave, having pieced together the full picture. Uh, we've subsequently found out that he's got about 14 other properties that he was letting. It's clear that it's a commercial enterprise that he's undertaking, using other people's property to make a profit. To simply go out and um, dupe somebody into thinking that you're going to be a respectable tenant at their house and look after it, and then to sublet it to, to randoms is just wrong. Coming up. Ow, ow, ow. Battles across the world over Airbnb's alleged impact on housing availability. That's not sharing. What's going on here is taking. What's going on here is business. And outrage, as social housing is listed on Airbnb are in effect facilitating the act of, of illegal subletting. In the UK, the government has bought into the idea of the sharing economy, introducing tax breaks to encourage people to host through online platforms like Airbnb. But some of the people who are benefiting are doing so at the expense of others. 
Critics say the site is being used to illegally sublet much sought after council and social housing for personal gain. Talking about the sharing economy, I've recently done a lot of jobs going to social housing estates where Airbnb rent flats out. Michael Evans, a tenancy fraud officer with Genesis Housing Association, believes it's an increasing problem. Subletting of either a social housing property or a council flat, it's illegal, it's a criminal offence. We are starting to tackle it and become a lot more proactive in dealing with this issue that seems to be forever growing. The effect it has on the communities and the neighbourhoods that we try to create and we try to sustain, it's damaging to that. One case Michael dealt with relating to Airbnb recently was in the borough of Camden. One of the residents told me that in a week you could have a different person every two days. This person is seeing it as a business. It's an abuse of the system. It's taken a mick. Camden Council's leader, Sarah Haywood, insists it won't be tolerated. Every housing authority and housing association in the country uh, has illegal subletting. The question is how you identify it and how you deal with it. Our social housing is a scarce, scarce resource. When we find people illegally subletting, we will come down on them like a ton of bricks. To clamp down, they first need proof, and fraud investigators like Michael Evans aren't finding that easy to obtain. My experience, uh, personally, with Airbnb has not been positive, so I've gone to them and I've asked them for information of the person's ad. They basically buy it back, saying to us, we're not going to release the information unless there is a court order. So it's frustrating. They're, in effect, facilitating the act of, of illegal subletting. Airbnb told us they remind hosts to check and follow local rules before they list their space, and work with policymakers to promote responsible home sharing. Housing activist Murray Cox has been keen to speak to residents in London about what effects they think Airbnb is having. Yeah, there are some people who've got great accommodation. Mm -hmm. They've got probably two or three rooms that's unoccupied. Yeah. They ain't do nothing with it, and it's a, bit, it's a way of making some money. But do you think they should be converting uh, residential properties into tourists? Yeah, if someone who owns their own house, yeah. they can do whatever they want with it. Do you have any personal experience? Well, um, the fact that my daughter and her partner can't afford to live here anymore. What we need is affordable rent mm -hmm. instead yeah. of um, crazy prices. Murray's experience living in New York led to him taking an interest in Airbnb. I live in Brooklyn. I live in a traditionally African-American neighborhood where um, concepts like uh, displacement and eviction and housing prices is very important. And so I think that's the same situation that's happening in London. If a residential housing is being converted into a permanent holiday let, that's someone from the city that can't live there. This concern is shared by the leader of Camden Council. It takes flats away from the housing market, which makes it less and less affordable for people to be able to live in Camden. This is not about sofa surfing and a blow-up mattress in a spare room anymore. This is industrial scale hotel provision. Airbnb told us they are continuing talks with London boroughs, including Camden, on how they can work together to promote responsible home sharing. The same issue about the impact on housing availability has prompted fierce debate in the US. In New York, housing campaigners have been in bitter dispute with Airbnb. While communities affected demonstrated on the streets, Airbnb hosts countered with their own rallies in support of the company. I think these communities have been pitted against each other almost unfairly. On the one hand, a lot of these communities are portraying themselves as, as the have-nots, like we don't have that sort of access to affordable housing. But then on the other hand, the people that do own these assets are saying, well, hang on a sec, I, I don't actually make very much money and this is a way for me to, to get by. Airbnb lost the battle when restrictions were put in place to stop entire homes from being let out short term in New York. In San Francisco, the birthplace of Airbnb, community activists complained that local residents were evicted from their homes to make way for short-term lets. So, families that used to live here, 
are not here. That's not sharing. What's going on here is taking. What's going on here is business. And let's call it what it is. Last autumn, some activists went so far as to storm Airbnb's headquarters, a big brass band in tow. It was part of their fight for an initiative called Proposition F. Stop the eviction! Stop, Stop the eviction! Stop the displacement! Stop the displacement! They wanted to try to crack down on Airbnb by imposing some restrictions on short-term lets. They were able to get a lot of media coverage and get their message across. Airbnb spent $8 million on fighting the case, successfully working with their hosts, who rallied together and voted in large numbers against the proposition. Ultimately, that proposition was defeated, and so, you know, it means that Airbnb could continue as it was. I think that they're still trying to position themselves as a socially minded company. And so they're doing this through trying to grow their community of hosts. They will be able to weather the storm, particularly if they're able to mobilize their hosts and get their hosts on side. Campaigners have had more success in some European cities. Berlin, for example, has taken a stand by banning short-term rentals of entire homes, introducing fines of up to 100,000 euros. Until May last year, it was technically illegal for anyone to let out their property short-term in London without planning permission, but many were doing it. The government introduced new rules to make it legal, but only for a maximum 90 days in a year. But data analyst Murray Cox believes often that rule isn't being followed. In the data that I looked at, there was more than 7,000 entire homes that I estimate are being rented for more than 90 days of, of the year. The 90-day limit was designed to protect residential housing, uh, but in fact, there's no way to measure that 90-day limit. There's no way to enforce it. I think the, the boroughs of London, from what I hear, are having a lot of trouble policing that. Councils need Airbnb's help to find out who's guilty of breaking the law. But one of London's big central councils is finding the company less than helpful. A quick look through Airbnb and seeing some of the repeat listings, which is one of the ways we get evidence to enforce, I think it's pretty widespread. We've attempted to work with Airbnb. They, they're good at soft soap conversations. They've not been very good at action. They have the data and they have the technical expertise to stop the 90-day rules being breached. We need housing supply in central London. Airbnb is undermining that and they're not playing fair. They're not playing by the rules while they do it. In an odd twist, evidence has emerged that Airbnb have been making their own moves towards enforcement on the quiet. In February, scores of people in London were delisted, simply told they didn't fit in with Airbnb's mission. William and Jane Perodin were among those struck off, effectively evicted from Airbnb. Said we routinely carry out initiatives for quality purposes and adherence to our mission. The couple have a three-storey townhouse in Soho, which they live in. Within that house, they have two flats which they've let out at different times. So suddenly to be kind of dumped in this way, it's all extremely galling. But there are lots of people on the site who've got maybe 30, 40 properties. I guess we are just subject to some algorithm and we won't ever know yeah. exactly. It's all to do with Airbnb trying to manage their regulatory relations. Something very similar happened in New York last year, ahead of Airbnb releasing a report with new data. They ended up being accused of massaging figures. We found that a few weeks before they released data, they had removed uh, um, about half of the users that had multiple entire homes, but they didn't disclose that they removed those, uh, those listings. And so we basically caught them in a manipulation of their community just for, just, um, for that data report. Murray claims some of these commercial operators have reappeared on the site. But what we're seeing in New York City is that um, in a lot of cases, even when delisting happens, those hosts still exist on the platform. And so um, Airbnb has shown that they still want to work with hosts that are commercial operators. Also, throughout the year that I've been tracking Airbnb usage, those, those populations have only grown. 
Airbnb told us if a host has listings removed and later attempts to list space in New York, they will suspend the host's account while they investigate. There's no doubt that Airbnb has helped start a revolution in travel, bringing joy, excitement and good value accommodation to many. I've loved it. Every single time, I've absolutely loved it. When I leave my city, which is LA right now, I give up my place to amazing people. And when I come to cities like London, I find places too. I stayed in one amazing penthouse uh, where my room was overlooking downtown LA and the beach and the sea and everything. And it was an incredible experience. And the company is clearly taking some steps to stop widespread commercialization of hosting, promising to work with cities and communities. But its explosion onto the travel market has thrown up a number of problems. And there are people who think it's now time for regulation. I think they are, there definitely should be some sort of regulations or just control over kind of the safety stuff. We need government to step up and get serious about Airbnb. It's exacerbating London's housing crisis. What kind of regulation is appropriate for Airbnb? Like, what is it that people are most upset about? Is it the safety and security of homes or is it about their access to affordable housing? So I think that understanding what is most important to citizens is really what needs to happen next.